this past week, you didn't get a show from me because we were on location in Villayosa, Spain, not far from Benidorm, Spain. Okay, those know the south. It's not a bees, it's in the mainland. Some of you never went. I was with Victor Simonelli, Maurice Joshua, Eric Copper, and Andy Ward put on this thing called Vocal Booth Weekender. And it was a wonderful experience seeing everybody come out. And we wound up doing a one hour special live where some people asked some questions and we, we spoke to some of the people on that actually were on True House Stories. Maurice's story was amazing. Eric Copper worked, talked about his life pre to Frankie Knuckles, when he started working for David Morales and Frankie. And then as well, director's cut and having most number ones in the Billboard Dance Chart of all time. And what we laughed about was when COVID came, Eric's number one with Diana Ross is still sitting in the number one position for two and a half years now. So, and Victor Simonelli's story was absolutely amazing. Hello, Mark Tiny. Hello, everybody coming in. And of course... We're going to start with, hey, welcome to True House Stories. I'm Lenny Fontana coming out of NYC. You know, New York has a huge tale in dance music, in house music. A fantastic tale. There was a time when we've had the biggest nightclubs and we set trends. Okay? Where we had clubs like... Of course, I've always spoken about Paradise Garage, Fun House, Palladium, Underground. But as well, 70s and 80s was a wonderful time. And it was also a period through the whole 1990s, which is a golden era as well, because that was another part to last of the big, big nightclubs in New York City. And why I say the last of the big clubs is because there was now this board of directors that bought sections of Manhattan. And when I say board of directors, meaning real estate developers, and they would set up in areas where clubs were because they bought all the properties around it, which gave them a hell of a lot of power to push out clubs. And of course, we had Rudy Giuliani, those that know Giuliani, was the mayor of New York at that time in the 90s, and his idea was to push everything to an area called like the red light district in the city, which would be the west side. We lost a lot of great DJs and producers due to COVID and stuff like that, of course. And not only that, but we also lost it to the change of the club scene. And as I've been going through my last few months, I've been reaching out to friends and people I revere in the business as true legends of our game who are still doing it. We've had Benny Soto in the past, and you know, you know, he's still doing it with his big parties and still pushing the envelope with seven or eight sessions and all those parties he does. And now we're gonna turn to the electronic side of the business, which I revere this guy very much, very much, and I respect him because, like he said, off off camera, we all grew up around the same time with this house music thing. Came up together. We, you know, some of us took the soulful part, some of us took the more tribal part, some of us took a smorgasbord of doing something that they love. They pick records they like to do, and also they become very famous from doing that. You know being able to have what I would say 12, 13 hour sets at clubs and take you on full journeys. And this guy's known for this. He's a record label of Transmit. He is traveling between New York and Florida. He's got a big story. He's going to tell us, tell you all about it. I like to bring up to true house stories today. My man, DJ Boris from NYC. Lenny, Lenny, Lenny Fontana. What's up, my brother? Love Boris. I remember that apostrophe. We love Boris the party. Yes. There we go. So, Boris, first of all, thank God you're okay and you're here. I just want to ask you how you've been doing because we see all kinds of crazy pictures of you living a lifestyle that. <laughs> 
some of us dream about, but we we'll, we want to know how are you? Doing great, Lenny. Just uh, you know, just back at it uh, at the clubs, uh, to doing a whole bunch of different ventures back and forth from Miami, New York, um, doing some some boat stuff, uh, as you know. Um, doing yeah, great. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we're here. We're here. We're alive. Right. We're, we're breathing every day. I, I, yeah. I, Got a yacht. It's not just a boat. It's a yacht, baby. He's, yeah, he's running a freaking yacht. He's not running a boat. You know, everybody thinking like he's gonna throw fishing rod. Fish no, no, no. It's a yacht, baby. Yacht. I mean, I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate that I was able to uh, get something like that and get something going uh, on a business level uh, during COVID. Ironically, so uh, yeah, man. We you know we have a great story to tell. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Get right in. He's, uh-huh. got, he's got. He's got. He's getting his gloves ready. Ah. First question, and I'll let him take you from there. As everybody knows, I ask it the same way. How does music find you, Boris, as a young kid? Um. So basically, uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, and uh, during my time in the late '80s, um, I had most of my friends were older. I was. I was just kind of like getting into the, like you know, music and the clubs. I was actually like 15 years old. And the first time I was actually uh, taken to a nightclub was the tunnel. Uh, And that was like in 87, 88. And I remember it like it was yesterday. And uh, walking in, some of my friends took me there. We walked in and and, um, the first DJ that I have that I ever, ever heard play music. Didn't even know what a DJ was. Didn't know anything. Just walked in, 15-year-old kid into the tunnel. And at the to- and, and at that time, in 87, 88, the tunnel was, you know, this shit. Um, it was that Johnny Dino. Uh, so Johnny was that who I, who I always tell him when we, when I see him, man, it's like, you, you, I feel like you're part of my history. So he, we always laugh about it. And then later on, you know, we played at Crowbar together for many years. Um, he was the resident. Uh, I was a resident there. And he was a resident in one of the side rooms. So we would always kind of like just laugh about it. So anyway, so that was my, my start. And, and from there, I was hooked. And during that era of clubs, you had so many amazing rooms you had the tunnel the world save the robots i mean it was a whole you know mars red zone i mean it was just and i was hooked and that's what got me into the music and the nightlife of and i and from there on in i said to myself wow like i need to be involved in this world like one way or another and was it you know i just kind of just started going out pretty frequently um i had many friends who actually worked in the nightlife back then you know they were older so um you know hustlers as we know (laughs) yeah keep it real real. so you know um and they would always i would always tag along i was always the young guy going with them to different parties different events different nightclubs and that's how i became kind of hooked on the whole scene and the music and from there on in i mean uh you know i would it was it was david at red zone it was junior at sound factory it was johnny at you know the tunnel uh you know frankie at the world i mean it was i mean it was that that's really my history of like I, I remember just going to the, to to Red Zone and just just always fascinated with like David playing there. I always kind of like you know they had a room upstairs like the VIP room. I don't know. I, did you ever go to? You went there, right? I'm I'm assuming. Yeah, I remember. they used to have a room there, like a little VIP room where you could just kind of sit down and overlook the whole balcony of the Red Zone. Right. And and, then, and and David used to play, and I just used to watch, and it was just like. Wow, like one day I'm going to be, be I, I, I'm going to be a DJ. Like, this is it. This is, this is my calling. And sure enough, I turned 16 years old and 
my parents asked me, what do you want for your birthday? And I was like, I want turntables and a mixer and speakers. And they were like, huh? Yeah, what? What is that? And I'll never forget, we went to Canal Street. Because <laughs> back then, that's where you would get the equipment. Yep. And we just, I just got two turntables, mixer, and some speakers. And, uh, you know, just got into doing that. And uh, for a couple of years, I really was like really practicing and just doing my thing. Of course, the neighbors hated me. Um, but, you know, and then I kind of hooked up with uh, the right people, right promoters at, at the right time. Um, and and the rest is history. I, I, I became a resident of, of a club called Tilt on Varick Street. Um, and, you know, the party was ran for about almost two years. And it was, you know, it was one of the, you know, one of the hottest quote unquote parties at the time. Everybody was going there. As a matter of fact, that's how I met Mike Weiss. Okay. He was literally the first person I met in the music business. And he actually started up he, because I remember I was the resident on Saturdays, and he used to do nervous parties on Fridays. So Mike and I met there, and he, I remember, he just came and gave me a promo of a nervous record, and that was it. Um, and I became a resident there from there on in. Um, you know, I just, I did the whole circuit. I mean, well, then, before I get to, because, but what was the first, opening for you that the first door opener to get you into in New York like what what happened and because you mentioned um I was doing mixtapes and I was doing mixtapes and mixtapes and and going out and going out and that's one thing I always stress to people and upcoming guys during my time was always go out always support always network always get always always show your face always get yourself out there like out of sight out of mind as we know. Um, so one day at the limelight, uh, I was at the limelight on a Wednesday, uh, and I, I just ran into a promoter and we just started chatting at the bar and I was like, Hey, listen, you know, here's my, here's my mixtape. If you, you know, if you're ever doing any events, please, I'd love to, I'd love to play blah, 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 whatever. So sure enough, maybe days later, he, he, he gave me a call. And he was like, hey, listen, I'm starting this new venue. Um, I'm starting this new party called at, uh, at Tilt. It was at Tilt. Um, what was the name of the, got the name of the, the party that it was. But anyway, it was, it was at Tilt. And he's like, I'd love, to, I'd love to have you play. I was like, oh, that would be great. Ba, 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 this, that, the other thing, mind you, was 17 years old. And he wasn't even able to get in yet. You know, back then, clubs were 21 and over. <laughs> so... Um, Basically, that's how that's how it began, like with 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 that. And he gave me a shot. This promoter gave me a shot, and we wound up working together for years upon years upon years. We did many events together. Where it was, you know, the Roxy X Supper Club, uh, uh, Sound Factory Bar. Uh, I mean, list goes on. Who was the promoter? His name was Matthew, and then it was, it was two actually, Matthew and Artie Arboleta. Oh God, I remember Artie? Yeah, you know Artie. Yeah, of course. I was wondering if it was those, if it was Artie. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was those guys. Well, Matthew was the one who really gave me the first. Uh, he was the one who, who who gave me the call, and him and Artie were partners. Right, because I remember later they partnered up. I think it was Joe Lodi. Who was Joe, Mar it? Joe Marcy. Joe Marcy, right. Yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> That's you see, people don't understand that those days of of peddling those tapes and talking to those promoters and hoping they would listen and call you. Because you and call you. I mean, you you there was only house phones. You, you, they won't call you no, there's no social media and no phone. You would text. <laughs> what text? Text you. They didn't even fax machines yet. What are they well, faxing? I, I think it was like beepers. <laughs> That's right. They talk about that all the time. Can I yeah. use your phone? Why? I got a big phone. I just got a phone call coming in on my beeper. Yes. Oh, man. That's great. So yeah. you, 
it's interesting how, you know, Tilt becomes the first club. Tilt is on 26th Street, if I remember. No, correctly. it was on Barrick. Barrick. Barrick Street. Downtown, sorry. Downtown, right. yep. Yeah. And then it became the Culture Club. It was like an 80s, uh, 80s club. Later down the road, like way after. So. Jesus. Yeah. How bringing, you, bringing you back, Lenny. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why I got to remember because I, I always get tilt com- confused where Timmy did shelter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always think that's the same club, and I forget that's the club that was actually down the street around the corner from where Garage was on Barry. Oh, my God, so long ago. Yeah. How long did you stay at Tilt? So I played, I was the resident there for almost two years, and then I remember we moved that party to, I think, I think I want to say it was Expo, and then there's sound, and then we went to Sound Factory Bar, and then Supper Club. Boris, when you say you're a resident DJ, does that mean you play two? No insulting part. I know no. that. Did you play only two hours? Explain to everybody what a resident, true resident DJ meant. I mean, you know, back then a resident DJ was basically there was no guest DJs, there was no openers, there was no closers. There's just one DJ, you know, getting paid 200 bucks if you're lucky. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, the DJ, what's a DJ? Oh, like you, you tell them, oh, what, what do you do? I'm a DJ. Like what? Like weddings? Like, are you a wedding DJ? Yeah. Like, what, do you do? what do you mean a DJ? You know, so uh, you would just, you, you know, you, you would just start to finish, open to close. There was no, you know, and you would be the every week. DJ of that party, you know? Um, so that's what it was. I was played every week at the same venue, same night, same six hours because it was t- 10 to four back then. And that was it. I mean, every Saturday night or every Friday night, and that was it. And that's how it was back then, you know, like whether it was me or Junior or David, whoever. You know, it, that's what the resident was like. Just part of the party. You are the party. Yeah. Man. So, yep, that was it, man. That's... Now, in the beginning part of your career, did you play dance music as we know as electronic house music, or were you all over the place? So, with... when I started, because I was into everything. Like, um, I mean, I, you know. Getting back to the whole tunnel thing, like the first song that I heard when I walked into the tunnel was a rap song, Eric B and Rakim, Paid in Full. That was literally the first song I heard in a nightclub. And I'll always remember it. So back then, very few people were just playing dance music. Um, so I actually got into it by playing everything. And I was known as the open format, so to speak, guy. So I would play house, I'd play disco, I would play Latin, I'd play reggae, I'd play hip hop, I'd play this all over the place. And I did that for a while and, 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 and different promoters, whether it was for house music or for hip hop, they would hire me for that, for those particular, like, you know, like for the, for that particular party. Like, I mean, I did many nights where I played for like, an urban hip hop Latin crowd, you know, they would hire me just to come in and play like two hours of like hip hop. Or then I would play Nels on a Wednesday and play underground house. So, you know, there was very few DJs who did that. Um, As a matter of fact, there wasn't many that I can remember. Not like that. Not, Not like that. that. Like, cause oh. I remember, cause like I would, I would, you know, I would play as crazy as it sounds, like a Gungi party. Remember him, promoter? John Gungi. Yeah. He would, he would, he would do all Latin events. I would, <laughs> I, would, I would come and do like a set of hip hop. And then the following night, night I would, I'd play at Nell's and I would play house music all night. So it was kind of like all over the place. But until I decided, I'm like, you know what? Like my, 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 I was always into like, my, my heart was always into the house thing. So I, I, was, I remember that. 
I remember that. I was always as, as and, and people used to like from all over used to hire me to play all sorts of music, but I was always like, you know what? Like house is my calling. Like I, I you know, and ha- like house is my thing, and like tribal and house was, you know, was my thing. Like, you know. So I kind of like in like 95, I'm gonna say, because I I want well, I was doing the all open format thing for like from 91 to like 94 or five, I just kind of just said, you know what? I'm just doing the house thing and that's it. Mm. From there on in, you know, that's what, that's what I, it's my calling. So then people don't understand this. Why are you getting, they probably say, why are you getting calls? Don't forget, Boris is also becoming a very good player in the game in those days because he's playing different crowds. It's like having a wonderful smorgasbord because he's got what we have called the drinking crowd. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. they love Boris because Boris can pull in the drinking crowd. Because the house people that he talks about on Wednesday nights that I would play for, they come to dance and it's a great crowd to play for. But they're not drinkers. They're not drinkers. And bars need to be covered. And when you bring Boris in, for example, for his night, he a promoter would feel more comfortable with the fact that that crowd that follows Boris around the city of New York is going to cover that $10,000 guarantee. Mm-hmm. Those days, remember, remember? It was like, and that was cheap, five, seven thousand, ten thousand. 10,000. Now it's even more to have a, a, a proper night going with a bar guarantee and everything else. Mm-hmm. That's why a lot of promoters were very funny about who they hired because they knew that with him, I should say with him, I'm sorry, say in third part. With you, Boris, they knew that they had a guaranteed bar drinking crowd, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's that's how we, you know, that's part of the whole open format thing. That's how it, what, that's how it all started, you know? I mean, the, during that era, like, ha- the house crowd, per se, they weren't really big drinkers. It was just, they come and dance, pay their entry fee, and that was it, you know? Um, whereas the open format people, you got all sorts of different crowds coming in, whether it's Latin, you know, whatever. Uh, so, so you know, isn't they were it, so, so how does the name, as we know, it, DJ Boris, what's that moment in, in that period of time, which says to everyone, you are now a house DJ. And you're famous now, like bang. The marquee goes. Boy. Oh, you mean like when I became kind of what? So it, oh, like all the nurse, you know, that moment. Everybody has that moment. Everything goes. So I'm probably so. Uh, you know, I was doing the circuit for many years. I was doing, you know, the Roxy's, the Sound Factory bars, the the expos, the yada, whatever. You know, and 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 they knew me as you know. Whatever DJ, what good DJ, this, that, whatever, you know, a guy who who was on the scene. But the turning point for me was when I became the resident at Crowbar. There you go. Yep. So for me, yeah, I mean, it was, and to this day, and, you know, people have their rooms, the sound factories, the garages, the fun houses, whatever. For me, there was not a room like Crowbar. And then, I mean, it was the epitome of big room. I mean, it was big. That was a huge room. I mean, you know, we were doing 5,000 people there. Yeah, you know I mean, you had everybody there. And I became the resident, and that's how I kind of crawled, like, went to that, took that next step. I was the resident there for almost four years, three and a half years. And that's really what, like, kind of, took me to the next level in the DJ world because then I started getting booked everywhere, not just New York. I mean, from Europe to Japan to all over the States, you know, and, and, and that's, that, that was the room that kind of like took me to the next level as it on a DJ. Cause I was just Boris, the local New York DJ playing the great parties Everybody coming out, loving to dance, whatever, the party, myself, whatever it was. But 
Crowbar is what got, got me the, the name and the recognition to do, you know, and, and my reputation. I mean, it's, you know, it's, listen, to play for 5,000 people. And mind you, Blenny, I was doing open to close the re- from at Crowbar as well. And, it, you know, that was, we were opening at 11 o'clock and I was closing 9, 10, 11 o'clock the next day. And this is, it started off twice a month. And then I, I, I started doing once a month, but you know, less is more, as you know. Yeah. So my nights became bigger. Because people knew where they were coming to. They Correct. Knew. So, you know, oh, let's go see him, you know, instead of seeing him more often, like on a twice a month basis, they, they basically gave me a lot more money and just to do once a month. Who was behind Crowbar at that time? So you had a crew of, of cats. You had the whole New York crew, which was compiled of, of Tommy Marinelli, Rob Vinegar, uh, Bruce, and you had that crew. And then you had the whole Chicago crew, because Crowbar's from Chicago, and then yep. they went to Miami, which was the Kenny and Cal's. Those were the guys. But um, so they kind of they were they were the the ones pretty much all like you know, and, and as a matter of fact, I was playing um, all, I was doing the circuit, the, you know, the acetarias and the discotheque, the small, more smaller after I was uh, type rooms and stuff like that. And Kenny, uh, because when Crowbar opened, they just had one resident um, and, and basically they needed to do guests. They needed to, and the resident that they had, he he was he was not really he was a New York resident, but he wasn't like a guy who was really into the scene in scene so much, even though he was, but he wasn't like like in the New York scene per se, like myself or Danny or whoever, you know, Junior at the time. So they needed that flavor at Crowbar. Right. Um, and then Kenny. You know, I remember we, we we sat down, we had a meeting, and he was just like, baby, you know, because that's how he talks. He's like, baby, I need you to come to my club. That was it, man. We, we signed a deal. Uh, I started playing twice a month. Um, and that was it, you know. I became the resident there. And from there, I went left there. Because when I left there, Crowbar was kind of like on its out you know, for various different reasons, not because of the room, but it was so political and so like, you know, internal beef amongst the owners that they basically was, was the downfall of that club. Like they just didn't get along one, like the New York guys didn't get along with the Chicago guys. And they, and they just kind of went their own separate ways. And then I, you know, I just went, and and started working with Pasha, you know, I became a resident there for like eight years. And that also, you know, gave me world renowned recognition because Pasha is a big brand, as, as we know, you know, world brand. And from there on in, I, I started doing Pasha events, you know, in different Pashas. And that was it. And that was with uh, Rob Fernandez, as we know. Uh, you know, me and Rob worked together for many, many years. Dear friend, he's like family. And then we, uh, you know, we did many, many memorable events together. You know, like Junior had his Sound Factory and Junior Verse and all that. And Danny did Twilo and all, you know, his moments in New York and Rawhoffer at Roxy, Peter Rawhoffer. Sure. And of course, these guys were getting all the A&R people coming around for remixing and, you know, sent, bringing their records and pushing, hoping that they would be playing their records and no less becoming really big remixers. Was that something that was also happening to you as well at the same time as this was all going on? I mean, yeah. I mean, there was tons of people coming down, especially, you know, the crowbars, all, all industries. I mean, from, I mean... Crowbar and Pasha, like, I mean, because they were the two big rooms that were like, 
just legendary, memorable rooms at that era, in that era, uh, at the height of like clubs and music. Like I, I feel like that was like the golden era of music um, and clubs because and you have clubbing. and club scene New York for sure. Yeah, it was there was no no better like time for like from the two thousand four to like you know I would say what to the like the two thousand four like the ten year period where you had Crowbar Pasha Limelight. Uh, Roxy, this, I mean, it was just, you know, like there was, you, you could go anywhere and three, 4,000 people, limelight, like there would be three, 4,000 people in, in these rooms. And like, I mean, nowadays to three, to, to do three, you know, those kind of numbers, you're lucky if you do that in one room. Right. You're lucky. Let alone eight. Yeah. Ones. Um, so you had different industry people coming uh whether it was a puffy whether it was a you know athletes or celebrities or, or or people from the industry oh you know can you remix my record oh can you do this oh you know like you know and and, and breaking records was like you know was was a big thing like if you play a record for four or five thousand people and it's not out yet, and they're like, "Oh my God, I have to have this record." Or who's the artist? Or, or you know, you know, it was, it was a whole different, like, different, different vibe, different whole, different, different. Everything was. Well, that's that's what made all of the the thing about taking these yourself out of the club and now making you an international superstar from the remixing side. Like what happened to David Morales? What happened to Junior? Right. Getting those offers as well from these major labels to come in. Please search for part two of this podcast on the platform you're watching or listening to. And please do not forget to follow us.